Good morning. I am delighted to be the first one uh, starting this uh, conference. Uh, today I'm going to talk about electron and ion transport uh, in microbial electrochemical cells and specifically I'm going to try to give a, a message of fundamental knowledge and how that is important in order to lead to applications. <coughs> we have a new website by the way if in case you're interested there's new stuff there. Uh, in terms of acknowledgments, this is an old picture of my team, but uh, uh, most of uh, the people that are here, we are seven from our team, so I'll try to mention them really quick. That's Joe over here, Don Juan, Brad, Rachel, Pratap, and then Mohammed that seems to be levitating there because he didn't show up to the picture. Um, the, the work that I'm presenting today was funded mostly by ONR and later parts uh, by CERDEP and NSF. Now before I start talking about our technologies, I wanted to uh, give an analogy with a technology that we are very familiar with and that's hydrogen fuel cells. Hydrogen fuel cells have been around for quite a while and on the left hand side is the first demonstration of a fuel cell. It looks kind of a dual chamber MFC, right? It's two platinum electrodes in, in sulfuric acid and consuming 2.1 cubic inches of hydrogen in 36 hours. And you compare that to current technologies which consume about 65 liters of hydrogen in 36 hours, a handheld system. And it really gives you an idea of how much we had to move forward in order for this technology to become a reality in the market. This uh, picture here from William Grove is from 1838, so 170 years. And through that process of developing a fuel cell, there's been a lot of stagnation and there's been a lot of new discoveries. One of the new discoveries that I uh, talk in my class, I give a fuel cell class, one of the, to me, one of the biggest discoveries was the, the, the discovery of Nafion. That's a uh, grot from DuPont in the 60s where Nafion was discovered. And that basically solved a big problem of ionic transport, which uh, was limiting a lot the performance of the fuel cells. And the rest is history, right? In our field, we have the discovery of anode respiration, the bacteria that on the left hand side we knew that could do uh, iron or metal oxide respiration and now we can put them in an anode and create these uh, thick biofilms that produce electricity. This was barely 15 years ago and through that discovery obviously came the applications and we are familiar with the applications Many of us here are, are engineers and more specifically environmental engineers which were the first one that thought this has real value. We can do wastewater treatment uh, and produce power, produce hydrogen, produce chemicals through this process but then you know some other ideas have come, um, have come along. Um, my main uh, talk revolves around and an opinion paper that, that still impress. And it's basically uh, talking about the importance of identifying, characterizing, and predicting fundamental phenomena so that we can move forward in, uh, in developing new applications. And here I show, let's see if I can do, here I show uh, a polarization curve of a fuel cell, of a microbial fuel cell. And here I show electropotentials versus current density. And this is a good example of how we identify and characterize uh, processes in microbial fuel cells. So, for example, if you just follow this line, that's just the polarization curve. That curve just tells you how your system is performing. It doesn't tell you much more than that. It tells you that at this voltage, you get this current density, you get this power. Um, very early on we started doing this, right? Looking at how cathodes and anode potentials change 
And that gives you a good idea of, oh, if I want to go to very high current densities, I have a problem because my anode is just producing 10 amps per meter squared. But if I'm lower than that, then I have a problem of my cathode because my cathode is uh, performing very badly and losing a lot of voltage. But then, I, then the next step of that is, so what is wrong with the cathode? We know that we need to improve the cathode in a certain way. So can we further characterize, go down the rabbit hole in understanding how this cathode performs in order to, to get uh, better uh, designs and better systems that perform well. And in this paper, I mentioned four different uh, things that I think are important in, in this step of uh, characterizing, predicting, and characteri identifying, characterizing, and predicting fundamental phenomena. And the first one that I'll talk uh, about today is studying and characterizing EET-capable microorganisms. And I like this picture. This is from uh, Bunn's group of uh, a biofilm and an electrode. I usually use this uh, to explain that biofilms are limited by transport. And giving back to, to the idea of my talk, which is electron and ionic transport. You will have a substrate coming into this biofilm. You will have electrons that will have to travel to the electrode. You will have protons that need to move out. You will have CO2 that will be produced and will have to move out. And we'll talk a little bit about those transport phenomena today. Coming from a chemical engineering perspective, I like this type of statement. It says, in a cascade of chemical reactions, the net rate is largely determined by the slowest rate limiting step. And I put here a schematic of a single cell and how that single cell uh, has different reactions occurring. And that net rate of electron flow will be determined by the limiting step. Um, that's maybe a little bit different than looking at the whole biofilm. The whole biofilm has different dynamics than the single cell. It's the difference between the person and the city. Um, but no, nonetheless, we modeled this following uh, Michaelis Menten kinetics uh, in, in this form. And in our lab, we've been developing uh, the knowledge of the Nernst Mono equation or the Nernst Michaelis Menten <coughs> equation, depending on how you want to, to see it. We've been working on this since 2008, so these should be old news for you. Um, potential responses that assume that this is a single irreversible uh, enzymatic reaction that is limiting the behavior of a whole biofilm. This is a whole biofilm performing with the response of a single irreversible enzyme at n equals 1. Um, and no significant deviations are observed sometimes. And that sometimes bother us quite a bit in our lab. This is an example of, of one of those curves for geobacter sulfur reducens that the data does not really fit the nurse mono. And it's not a lot, you know, for those engineers. Maybe you say, ah, that's, that's you know, within the margin of error. But not understanding what these deviations uh, are basically tell us that we don't understand geobacter sulfur reducens, that we don't really know how these bacteria are, are responding to anode potential. And that is uh, affecting our way to predict. And affecting our way to predict eventually will impact our ability to develop applications with this bacteria. So we've been looking at this curve and trying to figure out um, how, uh, how we can um, understand why there are deviations. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, uh, because Rachel has a poster, and I'll have it in the next slide. But what we've uh, done so far, and this is basically my main uh, graph about this, is that we have these two curves now. They look quite different, as you can see. And these two curves are both 
geobacter sulfuridusins. And what's the difference between those two curves? Well, the two curves are actually, if I take this out, it's actually related to potential. Those two curves are for, from the exact same biofilm that was uh, basically changed from the low potential to the higher potential for an hour. And an hour later, you go and you do that CV on that biofilm, you get a completely different response from these bacteria. Now, by going from here to here, not only did they change their main uh, process, their rate limiting uh, step, they've decreased the current. I, I cannot show it here because this is uh, normalized, but the current that is produced is slightly less. And that's very interesting because if you just follow the nernst monod equation, you get more potential, you get more current. But there are specific cases in which you can get a system where you go from here to here and they shift and then they go to a lower current. And that basically has led us to understand better the dynamic behavior of Geobacter as you're doing a CV. These CVs, by the way, are done at five millivolts per second. You have to do it fast enough to avoid them changing their, their uh, process from the low to the high or from the high to the low. So if I go back, this uh, behavior we now understand is a combination of two processes. And those two processes are minus 159 and minus 105, the, the midpoint potentials. And the midpoint potential of that CV that I show at the beginning is kind of in between those two. Uh, this is a poster by Rachel uh, that will happen today. That basically allows us to understand things like these that I'm pretty sure many of you have seen, where you do a CV at one millivolt per second, and if you grew this biofilm at a low potential, uh, you will see that the first curve has a higher current than the second curve, and you have this separation at the beginning, but the, in the second time there's no separation. Uh, and we have the idea that that's because there's some sort of capacitance in the system. In reality, this is just dynamic behavior of, of Geobacter. The current is actually changing because the, the, the pathway actually changed. If you do it fast enough, you get repeatability within the system. Um, now, we've done this through electrochemistry. Uh, but the problem of now identifying what that pathway shift means is uh, a difficult one, knowing that in Geobacter sulfuridusins, the whole electron transfer pathway is not completely known. But we can hypothesize that somewhere along that uh, electron transfer pathway, there is a shift. There is a change in, in expression that leads to that shift in potential. And we have concluded, without having enough evidence, but by uh, indirect evidence through electrochemistry and, and analytical techniques, that this shift has to occur inside the cell. It's a very fast shift that occurs in a matter of minutes. Uh, it changes the rate at which the bacteria are growing as well. So in summary, we have identified the problem. We are not yet at the point of predicting it because it's a dynamic behavior. Now we have to go back and try to find a model for this that actually gives you uh, the response involved predicting how they will shift and when. The second part of my talk is related to, electron, uh, to ionic transport and pH limitations. And I put this curve here where you see that uh, the, the bulk is at neutral pH, but we have a lower pH at the, at the anode and a higher pH at the cathode. This problem leads, uh, is, is from the fact that we operate at near neutral pH, and that's a big problem for microbial fuel cells. Uh, fuel cells are not meant to be run at neutral pH. That's why f uh, hydrogen fuel cells are either low pH or high pH. Uh, older news 
We've known that geobacter sulfur reducens is limited by proton transport. So the more buffer you have, the more current you get. So what are potential solutions? Potential solutions are, let's look for bacteria that run outside the neutral uh, pH range. We have the al alkalibacter ferrihydriticus, an alkalophile that we've been characterizing, and you can see that curve shifting to the left because of the pH change. We have a uh, thermonarobacter, which will be presented by Pratap later this afternoon. And this is actually a fermenter that runs down to pH 4.5. Another uh, alternative is uh, to use higher temperatures, because higher temperatures involve uh, faster transport. And we've been characterizing Termincola ferriacetica. You can see here uh, the curve of bicarbonate concentration to, to current does not follow this big steep uh, curve. So we get more current with lower buffer concentrations using this bacteria. Here I show this because it's interesting. When you go to very high concentrations, you start seeing bubbles. That's the CO2 that's being produced inside the cell coming out. So that's CO2 transport limitations, which kick off right later when you have high bi uh, bicarbonate. Uh, and that's a poster by Brad later today. So leading to applications, um, one of the applications that we can imagine in, in this area, now that we have these thermophiles identified, uh, is how can we combine them to, to with uh, cellulose fermenters to produce a cellulose to hydrogen process. And this is uh, a preliminary studies that we're doing right now, producing high current densities with a co-culture of, of thermocellum and ferriacetica. So basically going through that process of identifying the problem, trying to find ways to, to go around the problem, getting to a new discovery, which is basically the, the thermophiles, and then getting to an application that was kind of outside the realm of what we had, we had done before. Then the last uh, part is now pH gradients at the cathode. And here you have a very uh, enlarged view of how a cathode looks like. That's your gas diffusion layer, so oxygen would come through here in a microbial fuel cell. You have your catalyst layer, and then you have a boundary layer, which is basically related to fluid mechanics, and you will have in that boundary layer a, a gradient. And in that gradient, you will imply that the pH at the cathode will be higher than in the bulk. I like putting this uh, set of experiments by Cheng and Logan uh, because they show a very interesting performance. You have buffers of different concentrations, and you see that the performance of the anode is unchanged, barely unchanged, except for the case of, of wastewater. So we have a very reliable anode. But then you can look at the cathode, and if you uh, think of the potential should be 0.6 at open circuit, you're losing a lot, a lot of, uh, of voltage in that uh, cathode. Not only that, it's a function of, of the concentration of buffer, which is what I'll talk about today. So we have that cathode usually limit power densities because of the large uh, over potentials that you see at the cathode. So can we identify what are those losses and, and why do we see this? Um, we've been looking at uh, butler volmer calculations so that we can understand which part of that overpotential is actually activation versus which part is related to uh, pH uh, limitations. And you can see from this curve that about 60% is activation, 40% is just the pH gradient. In this case, with sodium chloride, you get a pH of 13 at the surface of the electrode. And that's independent on whether you have a membrane or not. This is just a boundary layer of a few, micro, a few hundreds of microns or even less. So if we put a buffer, that should help because there's a pH gradient. And it helps in an interesting way because this is sodium chloride. Depending on the buffer that you add on the pKa, and on the diffusion coefficient of that buffer, you will see the effect of the transport of that buffer. 
So the best buffer, obviously, is the one that has the pKa closest to, to neutral pH and is the smallest, so it has the highest diffusion coefficient, and that's ammonium. So ammonium chloride and ammonium bicarbonate gives much better performance than phosphate or bicarbonate. So let's look at ammonium. If you look at 10 millimolar ammonium, 10 amps per meter squared, you lose about 350 millivolts uh, due to the pH gradient. pH goes up to 12 and a half. You add 500 millimolar ammonium, you decrease that to less than 100. And the pH basically gets to 8 or so. So higher ammonium leads to faster diffusion, a lower pH gradient. The same can be done with agitation, although not so much, because with agitation you can reduce the diffusion boundary layer, but only to a certain extent. So you can see 0 RPM versus 100 RPM. And these are, by the way, models uh, from, our, from our lab. So we have a cathode model that uh, can uh, predict what is the performance of our, of our cathode in terms of pH gradients and activation losses. So application in, in this, uh, this is a work by Dong Wan, but Dong Wan is not presenting it in this conference because he has some other interesting uh, work to present. But we've been working on developing MECs. I showed you everything with MECs, but the pH gradients also apply to the MECs as well. We've been doing this with uh, normal uh, materials say the AMI, stainless steel cathodes, they're not the best materials to run an MEC. And when you do the system and you characterize it, you realize that the pH loss, the applied voltage, is compound of anode cathode over potentials that it relates to activation, ohmic, and then pH being one of the biggest uh, uh, losses. If we start doing CO2 in a recycle, so we put it, uh, CO2 in, in, a, in the liquid in a recycle, you can decrease that on pH uh, over potential, and we get an improvement of 200 to 300 millivolts. Interestingly enough, ohmic increases a little bit because now when you add CO2, what you're transporting is bicarbonate across the membrane, and that's a little bit bigger than the OH. And so you will get a slight increase in the omic there. So this is basically what I want to leave you with. Um, uh, an idea of the, the fact that our field needs more fundamental knowledge. The fundamental knowledge is what is going to allow us to understand applications in the future. As engineers, those that are engineers in the, in the room, we are problem solvers, and we know how to solve problems. Our biggest problem is identifying what the problem is. After you know what, what problem you have, I'm pretty sure you know how to solve it. So with that, I will answer questions and remind you that next year you should come to ASU for ISMET 5. Time for some questions. If, uh, yeah. Thank you. So I have a question about your nitrogen model. So mm -hmm. uh, you you prepare your steel vector by using a minus one forty five millivolt and a minus twenty millivolt, and uh, you mm -hmm. you found that uh, if you use minus twenty millivolt, you have more energy loss because the slope is low. Yes. Yeah, but the, you keep then. More plastic, so the bacteria tends to uh, carry out and not explode. So, mm -hmm. why it will? Yes. Yeah, so, what is the question exactly? Yeah, it because I'm thinking that you give them more plastic, mm -hmm. so the bacteria will be loved to deliver electrons to the electrons. Yeah. So, uh, just to add a little bit, and if you go to Rachel's poster, she'll have more to say about it. Um, this uh, behavior is very intuitive. Once, that we once we discovered it, it was very obvious for us that this had to happen. Uh, it's very analogous to, uh, to an aerobic bacteria shifting to nitrate reduction and back. Uh, Geobacter has more than 100 cytochromes, 
it's obvious that they know how to respire different types of iron oxides and metal oxides. So it's obvious that if you increase the potential, they will have a better pathway to respire at that potential. And, and that implies that to them, they want a, a, a curve that is shifted positive because the rest is, is gain for us, for, for them. So, so they go from a low potential to a high potential pathway. They can increase the energy that they collect. Uh, you're talking about the cathode or yes, the the cathode. Yes, it, um, we really don't have not gotten to the point where we look at complex phenomena like that uh, because most of our experiments are dual chamber experiments, not uh, single chamber. But we can we can definitely discuss the possibility of doing a single chamber okay. analysis. Okay, well, to stay on time, I'm going to actually uh, hold questions and uh, go on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Cesar.